Thank you very much. Today we continue to send our love to the great people of New York and New Jersey. We support them fully. We grieve alongside every family who has lost a precious loved one. New Yorkers are tough and strong and brave. New Jerseyites are tough and strong and brave, and they're being hit very hard right now. And for the next week, hopefully not much longer than that, it's going to start to go in the other direction. Our country is being hit hard, but some areas have done so incredibly well. We're so proud of them. Uh, they will beat this virus. We're going to beat it with the grit and the heart for which they're known and for which our country is known. And uh, we appreciate everything that everybody is doing. We also — we pray for Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He's become a great friend of ours. He loves this country. He loves his country. But he loves the USA, and he's always been very good to us. Whenever we had difficulty, he was with us, and we appreciate it. So we pray for Prime Minister Boris Johnson. It's going through a lot. As we intensify our military campaign against the virus, I think that uh, it, it must be brought out that we have to thank the American people for continuing to follow our guidelines on slowing the spread an expression that more and more people are thinking about. Nobody ever heard of it two months ago, and now everybody is talking about slowing the spread, stopping the spread. Even during this painful week, we see glimmers of uh, very, very strong hope. And uh, this will be a very painful week. And next week, at least part of next week, but probably uh, all of it. Look, if one person dies, it's a painful week. And we know that's going to unfortunately happen. This is a monster we're fighting. But signs are that our strategy is totally working. Every American has a role to play in winning this war. And we're going to be winning it, and we're going to be winning it powerfully. And we'll be prepared for the next one, should it happen, but hopefully it won't. Our massive airlift operation for critical supplies, it's called Project Airbridge, continued today as five Massive planes, flights, landed in the United States, packed with personal protective equipment. And our nation's heroic health care workers uh, will be the beneficiaries of that. Twenty-seven more flights are scheduled in the near future over the next couple of weeks. The Army Corps of Engineers is constructing facilities that will support more than 15,000 hospital beds to treat patients in need. So they're building now approximately 15,000. They just completed the big one in New York. They just completed and are in the process of continuing in Chicago and many other places. They're incredible. The Army Corps of Engineers, we owe them a lot, what they were able to do in such a short period of time. They'll build these massive facilities, 2,000 beds in four days. So it's really something very special. I know I was in the construction industry, and you don't see that happen very often. I want to remind governors and emergency managers that sharing real-time data with us about equipment and their needs is very important. All of their supplies, hospital occupancy is critical. A lot of the occupancy is uh, really getting a little bit lower than anticipated, and that's good. We sort of thought that was going to happen. And uh, we're getting along very well with the governors. This whole situation with respect to talking to us about equipment and equipment needs, giving us a little bit of lead time, so important. All the supplies, uh, we're getting it to everybody like they never thought possible. But we'll ensure that we can rapidly deploy federal assets where and when they're needed especially on ventilators. We're actually getting some ventilators back. As you know, the state of California was great. They sent some back, which they won't need. And uh, Washington State, likewise. And we have some others coming back, so we're using them in areas we need them. We are pressing forward aggressively on the scientific frontier of the medical war. Uh, the companies I've spoke to, the four leading uh, I call them the genius companies. Uh, they're doing incredibly well with respect to uh, cures and uh, also with respect to a vaccine that's going to uh, protect us totally, protect us. And they have some 
great potential. It's going to take a little while yet, but they have some great potential, some great early results. And the governor's been working hard, and uh, we are working hard with the governors. There's been great coordination, especially over the last little while. We've given them a lot of equipment, a lot of ventilators, but a lot of equipment of all types. And uh, I will protect you if your governor fails. If you have a governor that's failing, we're going to protect you. But the governors are working well with us over the last period of time. Um, today, in our stockpile of ventilators, and again, we need the stockpile so we can immediately move them from place to place wherever the monster hits. It's a monster. We have 8,675 ventilators right now in stock, ready to move. And we have all sorts of incredible soldiers. Our military is going to move them should they be needed in, as an example, if we need additional in New York or or the New York City area. You have state, you have city, and uh, spoke to Mayor de Blasio, and we really have a great, well-coordinated campaign with Mayor de Blasio. It's been really good. Spoke to Governor Cuomo. It's been great coordination. So if they need something, we have it. If Louisiana needs something, we have it. Same thing with Michigan. Same thing with Illinois. There are certain spots that are very hot. And we'll see what happens. But we'll know pretty much we'll have time and we'll be able to move it. In addition to the 8,675 ventilators, we have 2,200 arriving on April 13th. We have 5,500 arriving on May 4th. These are ones that we're building, for the most part. Uh, and we have, as you know, great companies building them. Ford, General Motors, uh, GE. We have really some great companies that are doing it. Uh, on May 18th, we have 12,000. On June 1st, we have 20,000. On June 29th, we have 60,000 ventilators coming. 60, 60. So we have a total of 110,000 ventilators coming over a short period of time. I don't think we'll need them. Hopefully, we won't need them. I don't think we'll need anywhere near them. But we'll have them for the future, and we'll also be able to help other countries who are desperate for ventilators. The U.K. called today, and they wanted to know, would it be possible to get 200, and we're going to work it out. we got to work it out. They've been great partners, United Kingdom, and uh, we're going to work it out for them. So they wanted 200. They needed them desperately. We now have 10 drugs in active trials, with 15 more soon to follow, as well as two vaccine candidates in active clinical trials. We'll do whatever it takes to secure needed medical supplies and bring more production of essential medicines back to our shores. We're doing that. We're bringing them back to our shores. A lot of these companies, they went a little bit haywire. They went away from this great country, and they had them produced elsewhere. So we're going to start bringing them back. I've been talking about that for a long time, not only with medical, but lots of other things. America continues to perform more tests than any other nation in the world, and I think that's probably why we have more cases. Because when you look at some of these very large countries, they, I know they, I know for a fact that they have far more cases than we do, but they don't report them. We've uh, performed 1.87 million tests today, so that's 1,870,000 million tests. Think of that, 1,870,000 tests to date. And now we're performing them at a level that nobody's ever seen before. As we announced yesterday, CVS testing sites in Georgia and Rhode Island will be using Abbott Labs rapid five-minute tests. We're down to now five minutes. It's a five-minute test so that people can get their results back very quickly. And we're actively engaging on the problem of increased impacts. This is a real problem. And it's showing up uh, very strongly in our data on the African-American community. And we're doing everything in our power to address this challenge. It's a tremendous uh, challenge. It's terrible. And provide support to African-American citizens of this country who are going through a lot. Uh, but it's been disproportional. Uh, they're getting hit very, very hard. In fact, uh, well, we have Tony 
here. I'd like to maybe have you come up and address that one, and then I'll continue. But if you could address that, it would be great, Tony, please. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. We have a, a particularly difficult problem of an exacerbation of a health disparity. We've known literally forever that diseases like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and asthma are disproportionately afflicting the minority populations, particularly the African Americans. Unfortunately, when you look at the predisposing conditions that lead to a bad outcome with coronavirus, the things that get people into ICUs that require intubation and often lead to death, they are just those very comorbidities that are unfortunately disproportionately prevalent in the African American population. So we're very concerned about that. It's very sad. It's nothing we can do about it right now except to try and give them the best possible care to avoid those complications. Thank you. Mr. Thank you very much. And Tony, I think you're going to have some pretty accurate numbers over the next few days, right? But they are very, uh, they're very nasty numbers, terrible numbers. In total, uh, 1,200 Abbott machines, Abbott laboratories have been fantastic, have been shipped now nationwide. Up to 500 more are being produced every week, and 50,000 testing cartridges are being manufactured per day. That means a lot of very fast tests. No nation in the world has developed a more diverse and robust testing capacity than the United States. We're dealing with other nations, helping them out, because the testing is very tough for them, and uh, our tests are very accurate. A lot of tests are out there, and they're not accurate at all. In fact, some of the tests, you don't have a clue what's going on. So we're working with other nations, trying to get them help also. At a time when many Americans are experiencing increased stress, anxiety, and personal loss, we must also ensure that our country can meet the mental health needs of those struggling in this crisis. There are people struggling. They're struggling. And some people are getting to know each other, frankly. Some families are getting to know each other on a positive note. But there are a lot of people struggling. On Thursday, I'll be speaking to leaders and advocates from the mental health organizations all across our country. And uh, we are going to be talking about resources and tools that we'll make available to them. They need help. And it's a, uh, it's a big problem. When you take something where it was the most successful country in the world, still is, the whole world is shut down. Think of it, we're down to uh, numbers that are incredible. Uh, as I said yesterday, I think it's 182 countries right now. 182 countries are under attack by the by the scourge, by this virus. But as we wage medical war on the virus, we're also speeding economic relief to our people. It's incredible. We just had a meeting that was absolutely incredible with the banks. I spoke with leaders in the banking and finance industry about our efforts to help American workers and employers. As of today, small business has, pros has processed more than $70 billion in guaranteed loans and will provide much-needed relief for nearly a quarter of a million businesses already. So we are going to be um, providing tremendous amounts of money to the small businesses of our country who have been absolutely clobbered. And they'll be keeping open, and they'll be paying their employees, and they'll be all set to go. We're going to have a rocket upward. Uh, I want to thank David Solomon, CEO of Goldman Sachs, Brian Moynihan, CEO of Bank of America, Gordon Smith, co-president, COO of J.P. Morgan Chase, Charles Scharf, CEO of Wells Fargo, Michael Corbett, CEO of Citigroup, Al Kelly, CEO of Visa, Michael Mibach, CEO of MasterCard, Noah Wilcox, CEO, Chairman of Grand Rapids State Bank, and we had uh, numerous others also on the call, and I just appreciate them. Uh, they are — we're way ahead of schedule, by the way. We're way ahead of schedule. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program has been incredible. So based on the incredible success of the program, I'm announcing that I'll be asking Congress to provide an additional $250 billion for the Paycheck Protection, which will help keep Americans employed to facilitate a quick and full recovery. Uh, we're doing very well. 
we're looking very bipartisan. A lot of people want to do it. And the, the plan is amazing. You know, they're, they're processing hundreds of thousands of loans. And this is the big banks that are doing it, the community banks. Uh, so, but the biggest banks right now in our country are doing it, and they're, they're doing it for a lot of reasons. One of them is they want to help people. The uh, WHO, that's the World Health Organization, receives vast amounts of money from the United States. And uh, we pay for a majority, the biggest portion of their money. And they uh, actually criticized and disagreed with my travel ban at the time I did it. And they were wrong. They've been wrong about a lot of things. And they had a lot of information early, and they didn't want to. They're very, they seem to be very China-centric. And uh, we have to look into that. So we're going to look into it. We pay for we give a majority of the money that they get. And it's much more than the 58. 58 million dollars is a small portion of what they've gotten over the years. Sometimes they get much more than that. Sometimes it's for programs that they're doing, and, and it's much bigger numbers. And if the programs are good, that's great, as far as we're concerned. But we want to look into it. World Health Organization, because they really are uh, — they called it wrong. They call it wrong. They really — they missed the call. They could have called it months earlier. They would have known. And uh, they should have known. And they probably did know. So we'll be looking into that very carefully. And we're going to put a hold on money spent to the WHO. We're going to put a very powerful hold on it. And we're going to see. It's a great thing if it works. But when they call every shot wrong, that's no good. We're in the midst of a great national struggle, one that requires the shared sacrifice of all Americans. In recent weeks, it's been remarkable to see so many companies and organizations and individuals like the banks that I just told you about, biggest banks in the world. They stepped up to help small business. They're big business, small business. The small business will someday be the big business. But the small business is 50 percent of our economic strength. People don't realize when you add them up, but they just — they just rose to the occasion. Everybody's rising to the occasion. It's been incredible to watch. To honor and celebrate the extraordinary examples of patriotism and citizenship, we're seeing — I'm asking Americans to use the hashtag AmericaWorksTogether when sharing stories of how we're all working together, get through — getting through this ordeal in a fashion that nobody would have ever thought possible. It's been incredible, and that's why the numbers are so far much better. We want to keep it that way. If you look at the original projections, uh, if we did nothing, it would be uh, disastrous. If we we decided to do something, we closed it down, had no choice. It was a good move. That was a good move. The early China move was a good move. The early Europe move was a good move. Made a lot of good moves. But closing it down was a big statement. It was a big, important thing. But we're looking to have far fewer deaths than originally thought. And I think we're heading in that direction, but it's too early to talk about it. I don't even want to talk about it now, because we just want to work. And uh, I think that uh, people are doing an incredible job. The doctors, the nurses, the firefighters, the police, all medical people, what they're doing, the bravery that they're displaying is just incredible. Every citizen should take immense pride in the selflessness and all of the courage and compassion of our people, the workers, the, the people that are working, and construction workers going into hospitals, knowing nothing about uh, this problem other than it's dangerous. And they go in there to rebuild sections of hospitals, and you have people in really big trouble right next door. They know nothing about it. All they know is they're going to get it done. They're going to fix that wing so they can have more people in there. It's incredible. But this is a national spirit that won our independence and settled the frontier and explored the horizons of space. And that's what we're doing. I mean, this is all — this is all new territory. It unlocked the miracles of science, and we're, we're doing that. When you — I wish you could have heard the calls I had yesterday with these great uh, companies that come up with cures to diseases. And the success they've had over the last 15 years is really amazing. So. I just want to thank all of them. They're working very hard. Uh, 
They're working with UK right now, and the UK doctors, hopefully helping with their great prime minister. But these people are really a tremendous signs of success are uh, staring us right in the face. I think we're going to have something that's going to be great in terms of vaccines and in terms of everything else that they're doing. Uh, just helping, really helping us, helping the people of our country and helping ultimately the people of the world. So I want to thank you all for being here. I, I will take some questions and then I'm going to give it over to the Vice President and they're going to go into great detail onto what we're doing and all of the successful supplies and medical equipment that we're getting. All of the ventilators, I've said it, but you can go over it in more detail if you'd like, but we're taking in uh, and building thousands and thousands of ventilators and they're very high quality. I said, you got to go for the quality and these are quality companies doing it. So, because there is a big difference between a good ventilator and a not so good ventilator, Tony, right? We've seen that. And uh, big difference. So, we're going top of the line. Steve, please. The acting Navy secretary submitted his resignation today, Modley. Uh, why did that become necessary and what, what role did you have in this, sir? Well, I had no role in it. Uh, I've, I've heard, I don't know him, but I've heard he was a very good man. And uh, it was a, the whole thing was a very unfortunate. Uh, the captain should not have written a letter. He didn't have to be Ernest Hemingway. He made a mistake, but he had a bad day. And uh, I hate seeing bad things happen. Man made a mistake. But, you know, you shouldn't be writing letters, and you sh you're in the military. You're the captain of a great ship, and you shouldn't be writing letters and sending them to many people. And then it gets out to the media. And, you know, the question is, how did it get out to the media? So there's a lot of bad things happened there. And uh, I had heard he did because he didn't want to cause any disturbance for our country. So that was a — because he, he wouldn't have had to resign. I would not have asked him. I don't know him. Uh, I didn't speak to him. But uh, he did that, I think, just to end — end that problem. And I think in one — in really many ways, that was a very — unselfish thing for him to do. What should happen now to Commander Crozier, who left? Well, they're going to look at that. I think uh, Secretary of Defense, as you know, is, is uh, you know, Mark Esper, and he's very capable. And I think he's looking at that right now. They're, they're going to uh, just take it under regular Navy channels to see what they want to do. But um, he made a mistake, but he shouldn't have done that. And uh, your secretary probably shouldn't have said quite what he said. Uh, he didn't have to resign, but he felt it would be better for the country. So, I, you know, I think it's uh, — it will end it quickly. Yeah, so, so, Mr. President, a couple on the economic front. Um, the $250 billion that was added today yeah. or will be added for the Small Business Loan Program brings it to $600 billion in total. Do you, do you think that figure is enough? Uh, might well, there we're going to find more out. Down the line? You know, when you see hundreds of thousands of applications, don't forget they're for three thousand dollars, for seven thousand, some for a couple of million. I guess one of the banks said a couple of million. So they're for different, very varying amounts of money, uh, and there's a limit on the top, and then there's really no limit on the bottom as to what it might be. But it's really popular. It's hundreds of thousands of applications. They really like it. What I like is it keeps these companies together, these little companies. Just like we're going to help the airlines and the big companies, we're going to help the little companies. And the banks are running — nobody's equipped to do a thing like that, but the banks are equipped. So the banks are doing it — big banks, small banks. We have many banks, community banks. And they're processing the loans, and they'll be able to watch it and make sure it's done properly. Talk today, sir, as well about potentially reopening the economy in the upcoming weeks. You mentioned the other day about a potential economic task force. Can you give us some sort of update as to where well, we're that thinking may about that? But we want to open up, and we want to get it open soon. That's why I think maybe we're getting to the very top of the curve. I spoke with Governor Cuomo, and he seems to think that he's getting close. And I think a lot of people think that a lot of places are getting close. We want to start heading that, hitting the downside. And I think we're going to be doing. This is going to be a very uh, difficult week. However, this week will be a very difficult week because that's the most difficult week when you're at that top position. And uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. It does open up. What can the federal government do? Well, because the federal government has it. done a lot, and it's going to do a lot. We want to — I really think that with the stimulus, we can be maybe even beyond — we're going to do perhaps infrastructure, which you wouldn't have gotten approved before, and now people are looking to do it. 
And the beauty is we're paying zero interest, or very close to zero interest. In some cases, we're paying actually zero. We have no interest charge. And, and uh, the dollar is very strong, and people are investing in the dollar. They want, you know, the fact that we have the strong currency. We have the currency. We, our currency is, is everything. And other companies, other countries want to be in our currency. So we're, we're getting all of the investment wanting to come into the dollar. The dollar is the strength. The dollar is the whole ballgame. We have a strong dollar. Other currencies are going down, way, way down in some cases. You look at other countries, I won't mention them, but other countries are going down 22 percent, 25 percent, 28 percent. And it's very hard for them. That makes it much more difficult with us. Our currency is relatively now stronger than it ever was, or it was over the last few years relative to other countries. It's always relative to other countries, but our currency is very strong. So, therefore, people want to invest. If we do a bond issue to do infrastructure, everybody wants a piece of that issue, even at zero interest. Yeah, please. Thank you, sir. Did you see these memos that uh, reportedly Peter Navarro wrote back in January? When did you see them? And how does that these memos sort of square with what you've often said that nobody could have predicted this? It sounds like he was predicting. I didn't see him, but I heard he wrote some memos talking about pandemic. Uh, I didn't see him. I didn't look for him either. But that was about the same time as I felt that we should do it. We, that was about the same time that I closed it down. Uh, I asked him about it just a little while ago because I read something about a memo. I said, did you do a memo? I didn't look for I didn't see it. I didn't ask him to show it to me. He said, yes, I talked about the possibility of a pandemic. Nobody said it's going to happen, but, you know, there is a possibility. There always has been a possibility, but people wouldn't talk about it. Uh, but it was right about the time that I closed it down. And interestingly, the World uh, Health Organization was not in favor of us closing it down. And if we didn't close it down, we would have lost hundreds of thousands more lives. So we did a good, we did a good thing. Yeah. So at the time, though, when when uh, Peter Navarro did circulate those memos, you were still downplaying the threat of coronavirus in the U.S. You were saying things like, "I think it's a problem that's going to go away within Which a couple right of days." About. It go. It will go away. You said within a couple of days, the cases will be down to zero. Well, the cases really didn't build up for a while. But you have to understand, I'm a cheerleader for this country. I don't want to create havoc and shock and everything else. But ultimately, when I was saying that, I'm also closing it down. I obviously was concerned about it because I closed down our country to China, which was heavily infected. I then closed it down to Europe. That's a big move, closing it down from China and then closing it down from Europe and then ultimately closing it down to the U.K. So, and it was right about that time. But I'm not going to go out and start screaming, this could happen, this could happen. So, again, as president, I think a president has to be a cheerleader for their country. But at the same time I'm cheerleading, I'm also closing down a very highly infected place, specifically the location, as you know, in China that had the problems. And we're closing it down, but we close it down to all of China. Then we close it down to all of Europe. Those were big moves, and it was right about that time. Sorry, sir, sir, just a quick, just, just a quick follow-up, Mr. President. Did you just Mr. learn President? about this today? Say? You learned about the memo today? Just I read about it maybe a day ago, two days ago. Do you feel like someone in your among your staff or Peter Navarro himself should have told you about the memo no, not earlier? No, it was a recommendation. It was a feeling that he had. Um, I think he told certain people in the staff, but it didn't matter. I didn't see it, but I did. I closed it down. I don't remember it even being discussed. We had a meeting where there were a lot of people. Most people felt they should not close it down, that we shouldn't close down to China. But I felt we had to do it. And that was at almost the exact same time as the memo. If you had read the memo at the time, how would that have changed the steps you took or the statements that you I don't think it would have changed, because I did. I basically did what the memo said, and the memo was, you know, the memo was pretty good memo from the standpoint that uh, he took, I guess. I didn't see it yet. He was saying that the U.S. would be warning that the U.S. could lose trillions of dollars and millions of lives. Well, you're not going to lose millions of lives, but you, you'll lose plenty of money. But uh, I couldn't have done it any better because it was about the same time, and I closed it down to China. And just lastly, you, so you maintain confidence in him and Peter Of course I maintain confidence. He wrote a memo, and he was right. And uh, I haven't seen the memo. I'll see it later on after this. But uh, it didn't matter whether I saw it or not, because I 
I acted on my own. I guess I had the same instincts as Peter. Peter's a smart guy, and he's a good guy, and he's done a wonderful job. But he wrote a memo, and I guess he talked to various people about it. But ultimately, I did what the memo, more or less what the memo said, just about the time the memo came out. I closed it down. I took a lot of heat. The World you know, Health Organization was very much against. They didn't like it. They actually put out statements about it. Uh, in all fairness to Joe Biden, he called me xenophobic. Like, I don't like China. I like China. I like the Chinese people are phenomenal people. So I was called xenophobic. I was called racist. How could I do a thing like this? Now, since then, Joe said that he was wrong, and he said that I was right. But I closed it down, and I was called names by uh, some of the morning uh, show hosts who don't have a clue what they're talking about. They're not smart people. And I was called all sorts of names when I closed it down to China. Now they try and hide that, you know, the tape of them saying terrible things. But that was a great decision. If I didn't do it, if I didn't do that, we would have had hundreds of thousands more people dying. Yeah, please. Um, you talked a lot about the WHO, and I was wondering, Dr. Fauci had, had discussed them earlier, so if I could ask you a question about that. Well, he respects the WHO, and I think that's, that's good. And he's worked with them for a long time. But they did give us some pretty bad uh, play calling. They've also, I think, given lots of countries in the world uh, accurate coronavirus testing that's been central to your guys' data modeling and so well, That I don't know. I can only say that with regard to us, they're taking a lot of heat because they didn't want the borders closed. They called it wrong. Uh, they called — they really called, I would say, every aspect of it wrong. So until the perhaps, funding freeze I'm does not, not happy about it. Look, we fund it. Take a look. I mean, go through step by step. They said there's no big deal, there's no big problem, there's no nothing. And then ultimately, when I closed it down, they actually said that I made a mistake in closing it down, and it, w it turned out to be right. But at the time, they, you know, they did that. So we're just going to take a look at it. You know, we fund it. And, and they seem to be, you know, I said recently in social media, I said they seem to be very China-centric. That's a nice way of saying it. But they seem to be very China-centric. And the they, they seem to China. err always on the side of China. And we fund it. You know, so I want to look into it. Yes, please. Thanks. A quick follow-up on that. So is the time to freeze funding to the WHO during a pandemic? No, maybe not. I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but we're going to look at it. You did say that. We give a tremendous — no, I didn't. I said we're going to look at it. We're going to investigate it. We're going to look at it. But we will look at ending funding. Yeah. To, because to, you know what? They called it wrong. And if you look back over the years even, they're very much — uh, everything seems to be very biased toward China. That's not right. I wanted to follow up. You talked about African Americans and how they've been disproportionately affected by the coronavirus. Seems to be, unfortunately. Do you plan on requiring the CDC, uh, any federal agencies or state agents, public, uh, public places doing tests, and private companies doing tests to collect that data yep. on the race of the people being tested? And the, the race of the people being treated and the outcome. Well, we're just seeing tremendous — we're seeing tremendous uh, evidence that African Americans are affected at a far greater percentage number than other citizens of our country, because we're dealing with our country. Now we're looking at it from a worldwide standpoint. Tony Fauci is looking at it very strongly. But these numbers have started to come out, and they're — they're very strong, and they're pretty obvious. I mean, you you, you're talking that, about — You will release that Seymour, would you like to talk about that for a second, please? I think one of the things that we're going to be doing with our Medicare data is to do that analysis. We're going to look back at the last month or so and look at, you know, related type illnesses. Going forward, we now have a code for coronavirus, so we can actually stratify by demographic information so we can look at um, race as a factor. We can also look at what the underlying health issues are as well. Um, so we'll be providing that data very shortly. But we will be doing that analysis. We're working on that uh, very hard. This is something that's come up over the last — I hadn't heard this, and then over the last few days, this has come up more and more. And I don't mean by a little bit. I mean many times. It's a real — Thing. Now, we want to find cures, we want to find therapeutics, we want to find vaccines, because that will solve everybody's problem. But why is it that the African-American community is so much, you know, numerous times more 
than everybody else. And we want to find the reason to it. And Dr. Fauci, Seema, both of them and others are working on this. And they're going to have very good, I would say over the next, in less than a week, I think you're going to have very good statistics. Couple of days. Something specifically so. aimed at those communities that are being hard hit, those black communities. Well, that we're are being helping hard them hit. a lot. But what's happening is we're trying to find out why is it that it's three and four times. Now, maybe that's not going to be the final number, but why is it three or four times uh, more so for the black community as opposed to other people? It doesn't make sense. And I don't like it. And we're going to have statistics over the next probably two to three days, okay? Mr. President, thank you. I'd like to ask a question on behalf of myself and a colleague who couldn't be here due to social distancing. Sure. Thank you. Um, who are you with? Who? With Hearst Newspapers. I'm the prickler today. Thank you. Um, some banks are only providing paycheck protection program loans to clients with whom they have existing banking relationships. And you spoke to banking CEOs today. I wonder if I you'll did. you'll ask them, these lenders, to accept applications from all small businesses, sure. not just the businesses with whom they have existing Okay, they'll be doing that. But we're also working with small community banks, so they will be doing that. It's a question I've already spoken about. Okay. I mean, in many cases, they have long-term relationships with thousands of companies. I was amazed to see how many, you know, you saw the number of applications. It's hundreds of thousands. It's a lot of work. But uh, I did ask that question, and they are working on that. Yeah. Thank you. And my, my second question from a colleague is, uh, Congressman Jerry Connolly, a Democrat from Northern Virginia, told uh, the local D.C. CBS station that you personally requested the CARES Act stimulus bill be stripped of $25 billion for the Postal Service. Connolly claims that unless the USPS gets that $25 billion, the agency will be run out of money by June. He accuses you of hastening the demise of the Postal Service. Could you well, respond the biggest, to that, please? Uh, oh, I'm the reason the Postal Service. The Postal Service has lost billions of dollars every year for many, many years. I'm the demise. This is the new one. I'm now the demise of the Postal Service. I'll tell you who's the demise of the Postal Service are these Internet companies that give their stuff to the Postal Service packages and I don't know why they're not, you know, I don't run the Postal Service. You have a group of people, so-called independent people, and they run it. But these packages are, uh, they deliver, they lose money every time they deliver a package for Amazon or these other Internet companies, these other companies that deliver. They drop everything in the post office. They say, you deliver it. And uh, if they'd raise the prices by actually a lot, then you'd find out that the post office could make money or break even. But they don't do that, and I'm trying to figure out why. These are independent boards. They were appointed by other administrations. They're sort of long-term. They're there for a long time. And I've been talking to them also. You can look it up. Take a look. They should raise — they have to raise the prices to these companies that walk in and drop thousands of, of uh, packages on the floor of the post office and say, deliver it. And they make money, but the post office gets killed, okay? So they ought to do that, and we're looking into it, and we've been pushing them now for over a year. And you know that because you've seen the stories. I'm pushing them. Uh, it's not fair for them to — to these great, wonderful, modern companies. They walk into our old post office with all these routes that could never be built. You could never build them. They go into areas that you — you could never do. And they say, here, deliver this. And they lose a lot of money per package, and they have to raise their prices. But this Postal Commission doesn't do it. Now, we just got a chance to appoint a couple of people onto the commission, as I understand it, and that's good. But they have to raise their prices. Otherwise, they're just going to lose a lot of money. And tell your Democrat friend that uh, he ought to focus on that, because if he focused on that, he could truly save the post office. Post office has been losing billions of dollars a year for many, many years. And uh, — have him take a look at that, because that's the way to solve the problem. You, thank you so yeah, much, please, Mr. Sorry. President. Thank you so much. Mr. President, you say this week will be very painful, very difficult. But a few weeks ago, you say this was just like a flu. What have you learned? I didn't say two weeks ago it was a, a flu. Uh, well, you know the question what? Can is, I tell Mr. You President, what, what have me? you learned that Ready? you could offer as an advice to foreign leaders who still are skeptical about uh, this pandemic and who are uh, against social distancing. What is your advice? What okay. have you learned? You said I said it was just like a flu. So the worst pandemic we ever had in this world was a flu. And it was called — you know that. It was in 1917, 1918. 
and anywhere from 50 to 100 million people died. That was a flu, okay? So you could say that I said it was a flu, or you could say the flu is nothing to sneeze at. And what can you offer as an advice to foreign leaders who are skeptical, skeptical about this pandemic and who are against social distancing? Well, I think there aren't too many of them. If you look throughout the world, and everyone, just about everyone that has practiced that is now closing up. Well, the UK was an example. Uh, now, they talk about Sweden, but Sweden is suffering very gravely. You know that, right? Sweden did that. The herd, they call it the herd. Uh, Sweden suffering very, very badly. Uh, it's a way of doing it, but uh, the, it, it, you know, everybody has been watching everybody else. And so far, almost every country has done it the way we've done it. We've chosen to do it. If we didn't do it that way, we would have lost hundreds of thousands of more people. Okay. Mr. President, Mr. President uh, there's voting going on today in Wisconsin. There were reports of uh, thousands of people waiting in hours long lines. Um, as they've had to weigh their own personal health and their, and their civic responsibility. Uh, what, do you think that the Supreme Court was right in its decision sir, that, that voting should go forward and the absentee extension should not take place? Right. Yeah. Look, uh, the Supreme Court, of course they were right, because what the Democrats wanted, and, and you know what this happened, I supported a man named Justice Kelly, who's Daniel Kelly, highly respected justice. And I supported him just the other day, social media. I know of him. He's a, just a, you know, fantastic judge, justice. And I endorsed him. And as soon as I endorsed him, they wanted to move the election. They didn't want to move the election. As soon as I endorsed him, uh, the Wisconsin Democrats say, oh, let's move the election to two months later. Three. They didn't mind having the election until I endorsed him, which is very interesting. And now they talk about, oh, safety, safety. Well, it was 15 minutes after I put out an endorsement that they said, we have to move the election. They didn't want to move the election before that. The other thing they want to do, which is crazy, at the end of the election, they wanted to have one week for proxies to come in or mail ballots. Now, mail ballots, they cheat, okay? People cheat. Mail ballots are a very dangerous thing for this country because they're cheaters. They go and collect them. They're fraudulent in many cases. You got to vote. And they should have voter ID, by the way. You want to really do it right. You have voter ID. But the Democrats, and this was turned over in the Supreme Court yesterday, I give great credit to the court, they actually didn't want to have an election day. They wanted to have election day. And then a week after election day, you choose your — all these ballots come in, these mailed ballots come in. The mail ballots are corrupt, in my opinion. And they collect them, and they get people to go in and sign them, and then they — they're forgeries in many cases. It's a horrible thing. And so what happened is, the Democrats in Wisconsin, they had no problem with the election being today until I endorsed the Republican candidate, Justice Kelly, Daniel Kelly. And as soon as I endorsed him, they went crazy. They went crazy. And you know that's true. And now all of a sudden, because go back two weeks, go back two days. They didn't want to move the election. They were having the election. They were fine because they thought they were going to win the election. Then I endorsed them, and all of a sudden, they think they're not. Now I understand there are lines that go back a long way. I hope they're going to vote for Justice Kelly, okay? Mr. President, do you think that America's going to change? No. So. Um, with millions of pills of hydroxychloroquine donated, is there a plan or system in place to track yeah. the, the potential yeah. side effects? Well, you saw there the representative. Serious harm. So, is look, there a plan look, to is there a plan the side effects? The, 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 side, effects, the side effects are the least of it. Yeah, people dying all over the place, and uh, generally uh, the side effects are really with the Z pack, having to do with the heart. The Z pack, that's the antibiotic, not with the uh, hydroxychloroquine. So, uh, a woman last night, I watched her on one of the shows, good show, Laura, and she was. Uh, she thought she was dead. She was a representative from Michigan. She was uh, just in horrible shape for 12 days, 14 days. She thought she was dead. I think she said that her doctor said, she's, you know, it's going to be very tough. She saw me talking about this, and she asked her husband to go to the drugstore. Now, this is a Democrat representative, a person that, you know, perhaps wouldn't be voting for me. Uh, I think she'll be voting for me now, 
even if she's a Democrat, even if she's a Democrat representative. And they went to the sewer, which I made available, because we have millions of doses. We have, I think, 29 million doses of this drug. And she asked her husband, she said, please go out. I'm not going to make it. Please, you have to hear a story. Please go out, get it. He went at 10 o'clock in the evening to the drugstore. He got it. He gave it to her. Now, you know, it's, it's — uh, I don't say it works like this at all. Four hours later, she awoke, and she said, I feel better. And then shortly thereafter, she felt great. This is a woman that thought she was going to die. It's — I mean, she's a Democrat, representative, highly respected woman. African-American woman. I don't know if you saw it. As you asked a question about African-American, she was an African-American woman, a great woman. A, her, her, her manner of speaking, her, the way she told the story was beautiful. I asked my husband to go and get it. He got it. She is now okay. I mean, she was interviewed last night on television. And she thanked me. She thanked me even in a tweet. She said, I want to thank President Trump. He saved my life. Look, I don't say that happens with everybody, but that's a beautiful story. There are many of those stories. And I say, try it. Okay, please. I mean, if you're in trouble, if you're going to die, and you're going to die, I mean, it's you're not going to die from this bill. Now, there could be some side effects, but the side effects is really more so from the ZPAC. those side effects? No, no. It, I, doctors have to recommend it. I want doctors. I'm not saying to, I'm not a doctor. I'm just saying we hear great results. And some people say, let's go to a laboratory, let's test it for a couple of years. And then, no, I got, we got people dying in this country and all over the world right now, not in a couple of years. They're dying as we speak, there are people dying. And I really think it's a great thing to try, just based on what I know. Again, I'm not a doctor. And I say, get a physician's approval. And they have physicians in these hospitals, great physicians, brave physicians. They also say it's good for the hospital workers to take them, that it's, uh, you know, it uh, keeps it away, keeps it out of your system. I don't know. But there's a lot of good examples. And, uh, you know, we have a 1,500 case study going in New York, and it's almost complete. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, can you but I appreciate that woman. She was great. You have to see it to believe it, the way she spoke. It was like a miracle. And this was not a fan of mine. But she's a fan of mine now, and I'm very honored by it. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Can you talk about your decision to remove Glenn Fine from the um, Pandemic Response Accountability Committee? And does some, that move and some of the criticism you've leveled at IGs, how does the American public have confidence that there'll yeah. be an oversight? Well, we have a lot of IGs in from the Obama era. And as you know, it's a presidential decision. And I left them, largely. I mean, changed some, but I left them. Uh, but when we have, uh, you know, uh, reports of bias and when we have different things coming in, I don't know Fine. I don't think I ever met Fine. I heard the name. It wasn't in a bias. I heard the name. I don't know where he is. Maybe he was from Clinton. Okay? You check that out. Okay? Maybe he's from Clinton. But we did uh, change him. But we changed uh, a number. We have about seven nominations in, I believe. We put seven very, very highly qualified people for the IG position. And, you know, that's a decision that I could have made three years ago and I could have made two years ago. And, uh, but we're putting in uh, — not so much for him. We're putting in seven names. I think it was seven. And they're going in now. Yeah. Mr. So President, then, when you talk about the WHO being China-centric, what exactly are you talking about? Is it because China is underplayed how many victims I don't know. They, they seem to come down on the side of China. Don't close your borders to China. Don't do this. They don't report what's really going on. They didn't see it, and yet they were there. They didn't see what was going on in Wuhan. They didn't see it. How do you not see it? They didn't see it. They didn't report it. If they did see it, they must have seen it, but they didn't report it. Please, go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, just turning back to the voting in Wisconsin and those long lines, who will be responsible and who should be held responsible if people get sick after they voted? Look, all I did was endorse a candidate. I don't know anything about their lines. I don't know anything about their voting. I love the state. I won the state. Today as well. Will you yeah. take some of the responsibility if some of those I won the state, sick? which is rare for a Republican to do, but I won the state of Wisconsin. I'm going to win it again because we've been great to the people of Wisconsin, as you know, with our policies. And they like me, and I like them. 
But all I did was endorse a candidate that's highly qualified, very respected person. And all hell broke loose as soon as I did that. And then all of a sudden, they want to change. Before I endorsed them, they didn't want to change this voting uh, area. There was no problem with the Democrats voting until I endorsed the candidate. Then they said, let's move it two months. Let's move it three months later. Safety, 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 right? All of a sudden, they want safety. Well, before I did the endorsement, they didn't talk about safety. It was fine for months. For months, it was fine. It was always going to be. And now I endorse, and they want safety. So, you know, that sounds... Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on that, how does the, the election, how, ha, them holding this election in Wisconsin line up with the social distancing recommendations that have come from your well, administration? Well, there you have to ask the people that you have a, a Democrat in Wisconsin as governor. Ask him. That's his problem. Okay? He should be doing it. Again, some governors fail, and I won't let them fail, because when they fail, I'll help. But that's run by Democrats right now. Okay? It's run by Democrats. You had a great but Republican. Is it possible to socially distance when you're voting? You're going to have crowds. You have to speak to the groups. governor. What you should do is call the governor of Wisconsin and ask him that question. But also ask him, how come it was okay to do this until I endorsed the candidate? And as soon as I endorsed him, these lines are formed. And I hear, Mike, the lines are through the roof. So, you know, hopefully they're going to vote, they're going to vote for the Right candidate, yeah, please. Can I uh, just check in on oil again today? I was wondering if oil? Yeah. Where is it today? <laughs> well, I, I was wondering if you. No, had, no, where's the price? Give me the price. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, How can you ask a question when you don't know the price? I'll look it up for okay, you. Okay, let me do somebody uh, else then. Go ahead. Do you were highly critical of mail in voting, mailing your mail in ballots for voting? I think mail in voting ago, is horrible. You voted by it's mail corrupt. in Florida's election last month, didn't uh, you? Sure, I, I could vote by mail for that. How do you reconcile Because I'm that? allowed to. Well, that's called.